In the 1950s and early 60s, the way of life for many male school leavers was to be either employed by the iron and steel industry or the mining industry. For those in mining, one could expect to see adverts like this, which promised a worthwhile career. And indeed, in those days coal was king, with nothing seemingly to challenge its supremacy. But as we now know, by the time the rapid closures took place after the miners' strike of 1984-85, then there is little to remind us that we ever had a coal mining industry. In order to reach Oakdale Colliery, people living in and around Pontypool would find themselves waiting for a Jones or Red and White bus, which would take them as far as Crumlin, where they would disembark and wait for another bus company named West Mom Buses, who would then take him to the vicinity of the colliery. When it came to attending the technical school, one would simply travel directly to Abertillery by bus from Pontypool. Once arrived at the colliery, most boys would firstly visit the canteen for a cup of tea and maybe buy a bar of chocolate or biscuits, etc. But for many of the trained workers, tobacco in the shape of a knot of twist was purchased and sometimes transferred into a brass container like this, which is really a snuff box, but as seen, sometimes used for twist, and in order to keep it moist, some miners would wrap it up in a dock leaf. The twist in this form was meant for chewing, but not swallowing. The idea being that it helped rid any coal or stone dust that was being breathed in while in the mine workings. This meant that every so often, the excess twist, having been extensively chewed, was spat out. Some miners regarded the habit as being nasty and horrible. Another item was snuff, for other miners would have snuff boxes like the one seen here, and which for some, a pinch of snuff was the order of the day. The older miners also carried a timepiece, but not in his pocket unprotected. The fine dust was the enemy of man and machine, as it would find its way into any niche or crevice. Therefore, the miners' watch would be carried in a protective brass container, like this. On the first day, each boy was issued with several items, among them a special belt like this one, which with an attached piece of belting was designed to receive an electric light battery in this manner, usually made by a company called Oldham. The lead from the battery can be seen fastened to a white miner's helmet like this one. The helmet being white at Oakdale depicted that the wearer at the time could be recognised as being a trainee. Good underground footwear was essential, so each boy was issued with a pair of green boots fitted with white steel protective toe caps that looked like this, and which also, like the white helmet, had the effect of distinguishing that the wearer of the boots was only a trainee. Each trainee would have two lockers like these, one at each end of the bathhouse, known as the clean and dirty end. The idea being that he would strip off his clean clothes and secure them in the clean locker. At the same time, put on a pair of flip-flops, wrap his towel around his waist and then carry his soap, flannel and soap dish while making his way from the clean end through to the dirty end in order to dress into his working clothes. Once dressed, the trainee was instructed to try to safeguard his working boots by applying grease to the leather. An ample supply was applied with a brush to the boots just before leaving the bathhouse. At the end of the shift, and having stripped off his working clothes and deposited them in the dirty locker, the trainee would again pick up his soap, flannel and soap dish and make his way here to the showers, prior to changing back into his clean clothes at the clean end of the bathhouse. At Oakdale Colliery was a simulated gallery that depicted a coal face where trainees would take from a conveyor stone, rubble and dust in order to build underground roof supports called packs. 
These were four-sided stone wall structures that, when filled in the centre with the smaller material, were designed to support the roof as near as possible to the coal face. Of course, going underground for the first time was quite exciting. Having firstly to gain a cap lamp from the lamp room and have it fitted properly in order that it would be as comfortable as possible. The weight of the battery usually positioned on one's right buttock, while the lead would pass under the right armpit to where the lamp itself was slid into a metal mounting at the front of the helmet, while the rest of the loose lead, as already explained, was then secured with a tie or clip at the rear of the helmet. When at the pit head, eight or nine persons would be selected to enter the cage by the person responsible for loading and unloading of men and coal. He was called a banksman, who would, when loaded, secure the cage by a gate. A signal of three dings, pause, and then a single ding once again, was the signal for the operator in the winding house to recognise that the cage was carrying men into the mine. For raising coal, the signal was two rings. The next thing the cage was underway descending into the mine at what seemed high speed. This was quite scary for one could see the bricks of the mine shaft passing the cage at high speed, while at the same time your stomach would be churning and your ears would be popping. But very soon one had reached the pit bottom to be met by a man who was to be the group's instructor while you were underground. The group were taught how to sound the roof for possible danger in the form of loose stones or fractures in the rock. This was done by tapping the stone roof and sides with a mandrel, which is a small pick. This while listening attentively for the different sounds that would indicate whether the stonework was solid or fractured. If fractured, supports in the form of timber outrights and crossing timbers were needed in order to make things safe to carry on working. In short, anything that was a danger was thoroughly explained by the instructor, for it was quite easy for a miner to get hurt, or even killed, if he was untrained. Even though hydraulic propping at this time on coal faces was quite common, loads of timber were still being used on both coal faces and underground tunnels, so each trainee would be expected to know how to use the tools needed for the many different jobs among them how to use a saw and a hatchet. In most cases, when the initial 16 weeks of training was over and each trainee was designated the car he was going to work in, he would find himself working with usually a senior but very skilled miner, who in most cases would allow you to share his tools until you were earning enough money to purchase your own. Remember, each trainee was exactly that, for until he had worked underground for an extensive time, he would have to be seen to have acquired enough knowledge of the mining process before he was allowed to work on his own, and indeed could not be seen as fully trained until he had done his training at the coal face, for this without doubt was the most dangerous area of the colliery. My designated colliery was to Pentis, and on my first day working there, I was surprised I was not going underground, as I expected, for most new young starters would have to spend several months above ground doing many different jobs, such as loading the trams with timber ready to go underground, or mainly working on the screens, which is where the full drams of coal were being tipped over a sloping grid. This would remove the small and dust directly into an awaiting coal truck beneath, while a remainder of lump coal would find its way onto a slow-moving belt, where boys and men would be clearing away any unwanted foreign objects, such as stones, metal, wood or paper, leaving clean coal only. When it came your time to go underground, then firstly a lamp was collected from the lamp room, but of course it was very important that a record was kept of those working underground, and this was done by issuing each miner a token called a cheque, like this one. When the lamp was removed, 
the token was hung on a peg in its place, as seen here. It seems these rings, bezels on the face of the lamps, could represent different jobs in the coal mining industry, such as electricians or fitters, etc. But there does not seem to be a clear amount of information available, apart from several people being sure that green was for mine rescue and one or two others that the fitters was yellow. Certainly, in our local mining area, a black lamp and bessel was the norm. Also, from the lamp room, another type of lamp was issued to the senior miner, to ensure no gas was present at the working place. Already lit and locked signified that it was a criminal offence should anyone tamper with it. Should it become extinguished, then it would be taken to a special underground relighting station. This is an exploded view of a miner's lamp. This lamp is known as a Garforth and was chiefly used by colliery overmen and firemen for gas testing. It is similar to the normal lamp except it is slightly smaller, but its main feature was that it could be relit by an official. From the right is shown the fuel reservoir, which held sufficient fuel for about 9 hours burning. Next is a securing ring, which when tightened, held the glass with the two asbestos washers and the two gauzes together inside the bonnet of the lamp, thus giving a gas-tight seal. This lamp has a flint lighting device, whereas for safety purposes, normal workman's lamps would normally be locked and therefore could not be opened without specialised equipment. When about to test for gas, and the area for gas testing is above one's head and out of reach, then this device with the orange rubber bulb is used. The bulb now squeezed empty is entered firmly in this white valve, seen here in a closed position. The stick being in this case one yard in length is now offered up to the required position, where a cord seen attached to the valve is then pulled, opening the valve allowing the bulb to inflate, thus capturing any gas present. With the gas now captured in the bulb, a plug is removed from the bottom of the Garforth lamp and the bulb inserted. With the lamp's flame now level with one's eye, a true gas reading by a trained fireman, etc. can be taken. In Dependis, many horses were used to remove drams of coal from the coal faces to the main underground roads, where the trams would then be linked together and known as journeys. These journeys were pulled by rope haulage engines to the pit bottom. Some of the horses were named Dewey, Ajax, Blodding, Bliner, Blowing, Major, Rad, Norman, Archer and Ace. Most collieries had horses that doubled as show horses, with Archer and Ace being two of them. During the holidays, Pontypool Urban District Council would hold events in Pontypool Park with a regular event being the horse show, where the day would be filled with show jumping and the following day would be pony racing and the showing of the horses. Horses working underground would have their manes and tails cut short due to the dirty conditions of work. But to overcome this at the shows, the handers would plait ribbons in their manes and tails. The colliery horses were the prestige class, and as many as 40 of them would be judged, and when the best were chosen, the handlers would go well with delight, and if the prize was won by a local colliery, the whole crowd would cheer as if it was the World Cup. All these horses had their own different traits. This is one recollection by my brother of a little pony working in Dependence Colliery by the name of Corrig. Corrig was a small pony with all the brains that any horse could want, and would use all of it to either help you or to make you despair. 
The one thing that Corrig did not like was for Handless to shout at him, which was usually the case with a stranger trying to be macho with him. His usual haulier was a man called Fatty Williams, who loved the little pony and always bought him a treat in each day, such as an apple or some cabbage and other vegetables, etc. My brother said it was funny to see the pony at break time, waiting for his treat. Sometimes getting impatient, he would nuzzle up the fatty who would tease him a little by pretending that he had nothing for him, or push Corrig's nose away. This would see Corrig running down the roadway, kicking his feet in the air and squealing. He would come back and fatty would say to him, You bad boy! Corrig would then hold his head down in a sheepish manner, waiting for his treat. He also liked chewing tobacco, which the miners would give him because once he smelled it on you, he would nuzzle your pockets and be a plain nuisance until you gave him a bit. Corrig was such a small pony that he learned that to pull trams up slopes he had to go very fast, so almost all the time the little horse almost galloped around the headings. Another horse named Blowing was a surly type horse, an untrustworthy, which due to his immense strength all manner of heavy tasks were put on him. Also, he was prone to taking a nip out of you, and if you were to come alongside him without warning, he would lash out with both hind feet, and in addition, you would have to be careful not to walk the short side of him, as he would lie on you and pin you to the side. Underground horses were tacked almost the same as ordinary horses with a collar and harness. The difference being that the ordinary horse's harness was secured to shafts of a trap or cart. Underground horses had a U-shaped iron rig also called a shaft and also held in place by the harness as seen in this image. To attach this shaft to the tram an attachment called a gun was used, this being shaped like a swan's neck. The haulier would attach the lower part of the tram while the top part was inserted into a square box in the shaft, which in turn secured the shaft and gun together with the use of a heavy duty pin. Whenever trams were moved by horse underground, a gag would have to be used. A gag was a piece of shaped steel bar that dangled from the rear of the tram, so that if the horse slipped while going uphill, the gag would dig in and stop the tram running backwards. As well as removing coal from the coal faces, horses were also used to carry full trams of timber, hydraulic props and bags of stone dust to the faces and to where the advancement of underground tunnels were taking place. One of the very first jobs underground I was involved in was scattering bags of stone dust around where coal dust had settled, which meant just about everywhere. Stone dust was scattered around the working areas of a mine in order that in the event of an explosion, the stone dust being inflammable would hopefully break the chain reaction of the propagation of the flame front. Stone dust was necessary due to the coal dust being so highly flammable. The amount of stone dust used depended on how flammable the coal being worked was. Therefore, the higher the flammability of the coal, the more stone dust was scattered. In the early days of propping up of long wall coal faces, it was done with the aid of stone wall packs like I've already mentioned, plus a lot of timber. But after the war, it was found that the aircraft industry had an excess of something that would revolutionize the coal industry in the form of hydraulic legs that were made to aid the smooth landing of heavy bombers such as Lancasters. As far as mining was concerned, these legs could be converted to prop up coal faces much safer than timber props. For instance, the timber props had to be taken out as the face advanced, and it was a very dangerous part of the job. But the difference of the doughty hydraulic prop was that it could be lowered gently from a distance, allowing the roof weight to come down gradually. As you can see in this image, this miner is on his knees in a low working place. He can be seen using a blade and shaft, which is a mandrel, and which is designed to have the blade detached in order to take above ground to the blacksmith shop for sharpening. 
to work on one's knees in this manner for any length of time, then knee pads like this were worn. In order to advance underground tunnels, then in most cases explosives were needed. A series of holes were then bored and then when completed, an experienced shot fire would be sent for. He would prime up the holes with explosives and detonators and wire them up to an exploder like this. When ready for the blasting to take place, the area was clear of men and tools and everyone sent to a place of safety, which was mainly to a manhole like this that were cut out of the side of tunnels. An underground tunnel was known as a heading. Of course, food underground was also something to be carefully looked after, as there were several creatures that would be only too happy for a minus food to be left unattended. These were rats or mice and a horrible cockroach beetle the miners had named as Red Indians, and of course, the horses, if given a chance, would steal food. So men would carry their food and water in tin boxes and water jacks like these. At that time, the staple diet for men underground was usually cheese, and plenty of it, for the work was hard and calorie consuming, so 8 to 10 sandwiches and a piece of cake was the norm for most men. Another item of food was usually a large onion, cut in half, and although strange, some miners while underground could be seen to eat it as if it was an apple. Alongside an underground tunnel was a pipe that carried the water from the pumps and every so often a tubular container could be seen at roof level which contained a stretcher for those involved in an underground injury or a fatality for they were commonplace in the industry. Some men were trained to be ambulance men and who could supply immediate assistance in the event of an accident but the sooner a man was brought to the surface the better for at the pit head was an ambulance room where a fully trained doctor or nurse could attend a miner's injuries. Just before I finish, I hope those who have watched this bit of underground memorabilia enjoyed it. While at the same time, any miners who watch this will no doubt have many fond memories of Oakdale training and working in the coal mining industry while at the same time, no doubt, they will also remember sharing in a leg pulling and a good-natured banter that came with the job. Of course, the work could be very hard and difficult and at times downright dangerous, but I'm sure that most would agree that the important training at Oakdale played a major part in one's safety. Even so, there is no doubt that the cost of removing coal from the coal face came with an enormous price in accidents and fatalities. But on saying that, many enjoyed the experience of being a miner, and listening to most of them today, they all seem agreed that the trust and camaraderie shared was second to none.